Um, I'll introduce myself. My name is Vanessa Robbins. Um, general profession, I work in architecture, but um, I'm here with you guys because we are a community and um, my son has super cell disease and he's 11 and I'm, I'm an advocate for supporting and creating great awareness of super cell disease. Um, I have an Instagram page, Instagram page and a book also. Um, we have Betty here. She's a parent of a young child who has super cell disease. We have Tara here with a, is it, I believe, a daughter, older, older person who has super cell disease, a young adult. And we have Orlando here as well with a teenage son who has super cell disease. And she also works with super cell disease patients as well. So today we will be talking about um, pain management at home. And there are some serious questions that I wanted to share with you guys and get you lots of views, opinions, and also some advice as well um, concerning us and our own personal experiences and to share with everybody. So um, <clears throat> I wanted to kind of start off with talking about um, pain in terms of our child suffering in pain, i.e. for chronic pain or crisis. And um, we have this idea, obviously, when we're going through and supporting our child during settling them and managing pain, um, we, it's, it's an open book and it's an open dialogue I want to have with you concerning um, how do we deal with it um, for ourselves, i.e. having the strength, the compassion. Um, moreover, when something's happening repeatedly, how are we dealing with it because it's something that's repeated happened before not just like it's the first time you know what I'm saying so is there anybody who wants to kind of first share with us can I pick up someone Tara what is it like uh, to deal with the pain of like yeah. witnessing your child having pain and just obviously we have this management where um you know we give them the penicillin um, and paracetamol, the ibuprofen, but obviously emotionally, how mm -hmm. do you kind of help your, your child? Um, um, yeah, I mean, at the moment, she, well, I say at the moment, she's actually 20 now, so yeah. what? Um, she mostly deals with it. I know, where's the time gone? <laughs> I know. <laughs> She's 20 now, so even before she was 20, she's always been one who kind of wants to do her own thing and handle it and whatnot. But when she was, when I say younger, when she was youngish, um, it used to be a case of like, so for example, I'll just give an example of her being in the living room, uh, whatever the pain was at that time, and then everyone kind of just rallies around and support. She's got like two brothers, me and dad. And, you know, we're kind of just taking turns, checking in on her and whatnot. But as she's got older, um, she kind of knows what her threshold is. We use the scales when she was younger. We don't do that anymore um, in terms of, you know, how you're feeling on a scale of one to ten and whatnot. Uh, but at the moment, so I'll give you an example. She just came out of hospital not that long ago. Um, but she was at home about a week before saying, you know, she had pain in her leg and whatnot. We kind of just checked in with her and says, you know, how are you feeling and whatnot. And she knows, you know, her pain threshold, like, you know, her limit. And then she mm -hmm. would just say, oh, I need to go to hospital. Half the time, it might just be a cab honking outside. And I'm like, where are you going? And she'd be like, well, I'm going to the hospital. So, and, uh, um, she's like, yeah. Clara, can I just ask? So in terms of um, the pain management, what kind of goes through your mind um, as a parent? Um, I did say that she's been in the hospital. I mean, obviously, as an adult now, she's kind of being a bit more independent. But I mean, what goes yeah. through your mind um, in terms of just keeping everything kind of together, not creating so much worry amongst maybe siblings or mm. uh, other half? It's hard. Um, again, now it's almost like we've adjusted to it. Um, it's the no It's normal. Um, but there was a time where um, there was questions like, because she's the only one and it was like, why? And, you know, why are we having to go? When she was younger, I was having so much time off work where it got to the point where I thought, oh my God, they're going to let me go. 
but um, yeah, it's it's a bit of a difficult one at the moment. I, I'm I'm talking as if you know she's all right and we're you know we're getting on, but when it really kicks in and it's really bad, you know, there's moments where you think, oh my god, what can I do? Um, you know, to help, what kind of support? Um, you know, even if she's an adult, um, before COVID, we would go to the hospital um, because when she's in pain, she has this um, personality where she's just snapping at everyone. She doesn't want to listen. And she needs that extra voice to say to the nurse or whoever's there, you know, oh, she needs this or she needs that. Um, so it's, it's mixed emotions, really. Um, it's mixed. Um, it can be hard. Um there are times when, you know, I just think, you know, you know, to myself personally, like I would just go maybe in my room and talk to hubby and say, you know, oh, it's hard. What do we do? But we just talk to each other, really, you know, tell, you know, ourselves or calm ourselves down or talk to each other about it. And, you know, that's how we deal with it. There isn't really like, oh, how do I say this? Every, every every pain or every crisis is different. Some crises you might deal with, okay, and we just maybe crack jokes. Not crack jokes, but we talk about him, you know, try and make her laugh to get over the pain. And mm-hmm. there's some where even after the visit, you come home and you just want to go in the room and cry like, oh my God, what is this child going through? And to be quite honest, sometimes I blame myself that, you know, not myself, but as parents, um, there has been times where we blamed ourselves that, we actually brought her into this our genes or you know something has contributed to her going through that but i keep going back amira is a strong individual that sometimes she'll just look at you like what is your problem i said i'm fine why are you worrying i said i'm fine even going to the hospital the child's packed the bag and she's like bye i'll see you later and i'm like don't you want me to come with you don't you want me to do Mm. this and but because of the person she she she's making me stronger that I don't have to worry about it. So maybe if she was a bit more clingy, I don't know. But there's mm. something about her she's a strong individual and she makes me feel like I don't have to worry sometimes. Okay. And so yeah. we have Betty here who has a young child. Um what about you? What kind of goes through your mind and um I guess with your other family members? How how do you kind of do your best to kind of keep everything, not everything together, but just to kind of be more supportive and less worrying and less anxious, I guess, but just be more positive. I mean, how how is it for you? It's been hard, but I just had to accept it. And I just, when she's in pain, I just have to say, sorry, I'm just sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm just so sorry. And, mm-hmm. you know, validate the fact that she is going through that pain. And then I sometimes say, like, I know, I know it hurts, but can we try your deep breathing? I know it hurts. Let's try the hot water bottle. I know it hurts. So it's like hot water bottle, massaging, any kind of physical thing that I can do to ease the pain and just talking through it. Like, I know, I understand. I'm really sorry that you have to go through this and just validating it and just comfort and just, you know, hugging her and loving on her and stuff right, right. so that's how because it, it's just the reality yeah, of it that's really good Orlando you kind of I understand you work with uh, sickle cell disease patients well you kind of encounter with a lot of them um, as well as you having your own child um, what kind of is like we've, we've noticed Tara saying that how you know her daughter is more independent now um, she's kind of been more um, embracing everything and taking on everything um, what's your kind of feedback in terms of, um, as sickle cell disease within other people, and is there like a commonality in the way that they want us to deal with it for them and help them? Is there, is there anything that you found, um, I would say as something that they want or particular appreciate more than, or in your experience? Um, well, I mean, I know both. Tara and Betty because they're both part of the Solace group so it's quite interesting to to see that there's no one from any other group here <laughs> so, but anyway that's all good for us I suppose um, in terms of other people well I think I have a mixture of um, information from people because I'm I'm on the board the Solace board 
and I represent for um, parents and carers. But other members on the board, they have very, very different ways of how they deal with their pain and, and how they um, want people to deal with them. But mm -hmm. just as an example, um, my mother also had sickle cell and I looked after my mother and my son at one point at the same time. Wow. And um, it, it, it was really difficult because on the one hand, I've got my son who I've got to do everything for. And for my mum, obviously, she's a fiercely independent woman. Um, mm -hmm. And she also didn't want me to bother looking after her. She wanted me to just leave her in her pain. And I'm like, no, I don't think so, mum. You're my mum. You know, he's my son, but you're my mum. And I've mm -hmm. got to care for both of you. Um, so it, it was very difficult when I mean my mother's passed away now but um, it was very difficult when I had to deal with both um, but in terms of most of our members I would say I would say quite a lot of our members want to just um, be treated properly and equally as other patients are treated some of them feel that they're not treated that way and certainly, I mean, my son is going to be um, going to adult care next year. And that completely freaks me out because mm -hmm. I hear the adult patients in the patient representative group speaking mm -hmm. about how difficult it is to even, when they go to MDU, the medical day unit, they find it really difficult. Um, to get the kind of support and care that they need. And it's, it's tricky because um, <clears throat> for them, living with the condition, they've had it all their lives, obviously. Um, mm. But for them, it's, it's like, well, what do I, what, how do I explain this? You know, I've got a protocol, but if for some people, like I was reading, somebody was saying she had to go to a different hospital and she felt really, really bad because she wasn't getting the treatment that she normally gets. She tried to tell them to follow her protocol. They were not following her protocol properly. And so she felt that, why, why am I going through this? I'm mm. telling you to follow my protocol, look after me properly. Don't treat me as if I'm just making up this pain. And I think that's one of the, the biggest issues that many people with sickle cell have is that, you know, it's an invisible disease and they can't do anything about it it's it's really really tricky um so yeah so um i think what is quite common i feel like even i guess the scenario changes when you're an adult but the, that story you know, and that saying like why me that kind of rings from very early um in my in my own experience with my son um like from the age of five he was saying like why me questions um, and I, I was always conscious of staring him away from being kind of like a victim of sexuality and feeling like he's been targeted or just because of the whole episodes of like the whole doctors, the whole hospitals, not seeing your friends, not participating in school and then having to miss work, having to catch up, that whole scenario mm. um, that comes with the changes and what happens and having to adapt and then try to come back to some form of normality. Um, <clears throat> I guess my question is, um, what, hmm, how do you um, steer away, steer away from them feeling kind of victimized or even not resentful, but really bitter or negative about it? How, how do you, how do you help? How do you help in that way um, of them feeling like victimized or feeling like why me or negative about it? How do you kind of... It's, it's a real issue. It's a real mm -hmm. issue. And it's one which we encountered with our son. I think for the first time, I wasn't... Well, I don't know where I was actually. He was about seven. Right. And um, my husband told me that he heard him whimpering in the shower. And so he went to the... Because this is when we, you know trust him to shower himself properly or whatever, but just mm -hmm. quite close. Um, and then he, my, my husband went to him and said, well, what, what's the, why are you crying? What's the matter? And he said, um, 
all this pain what's the point what's the point and obviously you know at that age it's, it's, they don't articulate themselves as well as he would now but mm -hmm. he was just in tears he just didn't he said i don't want it i don't want it all this is too much it's too much pain it's too much pain it was awful really really awful and when they get um those really seriously bad crises and you mm -hmm. witness them crying screaming mm -hmm. all of that it's exactly what Tara said and, and Betty too that you know we as parents we are responsible for our children huh. and even though you might think logically it's not our fault but it's something that we carry with us and I'm sure I speak I say the same for the two of you we carry with us all the time it's always there it might not be here at the front mm. but it definitely comes up when that child starts to have pain especially when you're not sure well like for example the other day Amiri had pain in his stomach and every so often he gets that same pain and I remember I said to him well what's your pain score you know your normal things with a child whatever uh. And um, I said to him, I just don't know what it is. I really don't know what it is. Thank mm. God it, it went away. But he regularly has these kind of stomach cramp, stomach things, and I don't know what they are. And um, when I ask the doctors, their answer is usually, well, it's hard to tell, really don't know. <laughs> but I do, but they, I think there was one point where they did check him out because he had a, a kidney function issue. And they said that he has got gallstones. And I thought, oh my God, because I remember my mum had gallstones and it was, it got really, really painful, like seriously painful. And they had, at one point they had to remove them. So I was thinking, oh, please, please don't let it be that for him. Don't let it be that for him. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's, it's difficult when your child is in that pain and they're feeling like, well, what do I do? What do I do about it? Can I do anything about it? And, you know, at the moment, the answer is no, not really. Mm. Um, so, yeah, anyway, let me shut up now. Let <laughs> no, it's true, though. Um, you, yeah, that's really important what you said. Sorry, go on, Tara. No, I was just going to support what, you know, Miss L said. Um, <laughs> it's hard. Um, she did do that as well, where she went through the why me, especially with her brothers not having it. Um, I can't remember the age she was. It was in her teens uh, where she went, you know, why am I the only one and whatnot? But, you know, no matter how old they get, no matter, you know, the age they get, it's, mm -hmm. the question is always there, you know. You, you know, lovingly made that child, don't get me wrong, but you also, in essence, gave them that condition. So, you know, we might say, you know, it's not really our fault but again it goes both ways you know we did in a way and we have to just support them the best we can um, mm -hmm. so, like I said if as much as I say she's independent and she wants to do her own thing you can see that she needs that help she needs that voice uh, because as you know Miss O said when, when you go to the hospital especially with adults I've been there sometimes where they just plunk the medicine on the on the counter or the table and walk away it's down to you you don't take it your problem and I'm like well the child's sleeping if you know somebody else will come along and knock it or do, do you get what I'm trying to say right. if she doesn't know or you I know she's an adult and she want you know sometimes they want to be treated about like an adult but in this particular circumstance it will make sense mm. for somebody a either to wake her up or if they don't want to wake her up bring it back when she's awake and give it to her in her hand and say take it now please it will help with you know whatever the child is dealing with so you know as much as i like to encourage people that you know adult is part of the transition it's a whole totally different ball game. Yeah. Okay. I've seen it. Um, it, yeah. How do you um so I'm not sure if you guys have like if they have, if you guys have other sons and daughters, but even in general, um how is it how um I can't, I guess I'm not sure if you guys have siblings, but I guess what I'm trying to say is in terms of communicating to other people. I found, like, for example, when my son was um, maybe four or five, and I've learned a lot, but there was times when we would be rushing to the school, the school run, 
and then he'd be like, oh, mum, you're too fast, you know, stop walking, you know, you know what I mean? So I would piggy bank him. And mm. people would look at me like, why are you piggy banking your child? Mm -hmm. Like, it's like a thing. And this time, he sometimes he'll be seven, even nine. Uh, if mm -hmm. I had the strength, I'm piggy banking my son, you know? Mm. And I have people looking at me like, why are you piggy banking? Because I know we need to get to A to B, and I don't want mm -hmm. my son to know I'm getting into any pains. And mm. I think really it's my fault, do you understand? So I will piggy bank him. So I have other people look at me, which are strangers, so I don't need to explain anything to them. Mm -hmm. But in terms of siblings and people who live in your household, um, like how, how are you communicating that with, like how are you communicating yourself to them? And also, I want to ask you, um, like, I, I can assume you don't hide it because obviously there's times when you can see what's going on in front of you in the house or in the home. Um, mm -hmm. But how do you allow your siblings and I guess, how do you communicate to them and how do you allow them to kind of help or, you know, just keep a normal relationship amongst what happens? Does that make sense? It's, it's hot yeah. 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 I mean, sorry, I'm, I'm jumping in again. If somebody else wants to talk, they can take over. Um, but for me, I'll be honest, initially I hid it. When I started it, I didn't talk about it. Um, but then, when there was a lot of things happening, you know, like hospital visits, you know, having to, you know, t get medication or give a medication or you know, making arrangements and then having to cancel them because I couldn't or, you know, I hid it. But then I thought to myself, why? You know, I need to educate, you know, give people the knowledge because if they don't know, um, say, for example, somebody wants her to come over for a sleepover and I'm like, well, not really um, because she's, I don't know, in the middle or she might be well, but her going away from the house you know be like what if something happens how do they know what to do because everywhere we go if we're traveling or whether we're even not even traveling if we're going for a, like a trip we pack the bag as if we're leaving the country mm. you have to have your paracetamol your ibuprofen your codeine because you, already know. you could be in the middle of xyz and the child's like ouch and you're like okay mm. you know so you need to be prepared so i stopped hiding it i can't remember the age that i stopped i just told everyone and everyone the family know anyway because they can see um right what happened with the mirror is her lips go really pink and everyone knows even the little one would be like oh can you ask her, is she all right uh, sorry i say little one he's 11 um is she all right and um just ask if she's okay or he would even go to her and say are you all right and she's like yeah i'm fine or whatever but you can tell she's in discomfort mm -hmm. so everyone even my friends everyone knows it'll be like you know she's got it and this is what we need to do um so i i don't hide it no more and anyone i can tell about it i will uh because uh, with amira also um she lost her hearing I don't know if it's sickle cell related. She oh, wasn't I've heard born. about that actually. Yeah. Uh, along the line, her, she, her hearing got knocked out. That again is a story for another day. Mm -hmm. So having to deal with the hearing loss and it happened um, over the school holidays. So when they resumed back, my child had to go in with um, a um, sketchy board thingy me, Bob. Right. So that she could communicate because the school was, they weren't prepared for it. It just happened over summer. Um, so yeah, she's got the cochlear implants, thank God. Um, so yeah, uh, we're just dealing with it, and I'm telling everyone and anyone who right. wants to hear my story, I'll be like, Right, so how long have you got? Let's talk, let's do it. Yeah, you have to, otherwise, people don't know. When people are so ignorant, listen, if I start off here, yeah, we'll be here all day. People are so ignorant. Know. <laughs> even in the hospitals. I know mm. some of them, uh, sorry, don't get me wrong, some of them do the great job, they do the best mm. they can do, but when they hear sickle cell, somebody's still asking me, like, what is it? I'm like, you're in a hospital, you're asking me, what is it? Mm. Don't start me off, girl, but like I said, I want to keep it simple, I don't want to, i let somebody else take, take, take over, but yeah, up till today, I'm not even joking, you'll have people ask you, oh, what is it? 
Oh, it's a blood. Oh, yeah. How does it? And I'm like, go and check Google or something. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> yeah. It's just, yeah, it's just and one of those things. And what about you? Um, and I didn't hide it. I'd, I told my son, everybody in my family knows I didn't hide it. And then I told my friends as well because she started to get um, a lot of crisis when she was about eight, nine months, 12 months. We were just in and out of hospital, in and out of hospital. So people call and say, where are you? I'm like, we're in hospital. Okay. This, that and the other. And I found them to be so, so because I, I told them about it, they were just so supportive about it. And now they understand. I totally understand if I go anywhere, I have to risk success. I need to plan out transport, exactly how we're going to go home. If it's sunny like now and we're coming back in the evening, extra clothing, mm -hmm. a blanket, because yeah. you, you never yeah. know when pain mm -hmm. hits. And when the pain hits and you don't deal with it immediately, mm -hmm. it just becomes even more worse. So it's about dealing with it quickly and maintaining it until you know they can't take it anymore you need um, like further medical assistance but i literally make sure everybody knows that my daughter has this condition and if it's raining i'm sorry what we, about? we reschedule it to another day because mm -hmm. i don't want to be in and out of the hospital i mean certain things is it's just it can be rearranged it's not a life and right, death thing right, right. But her mm -hmm. getting caught in the rain or caught in the snow is going to be a life and death thing for her so it's just all about letting people know that this is the case we're going to rearrange about the previous question about um how to deal with them it's all about affirming i uh, affirm my daughter all the time i know she has this condition but at the end of the day she also has this amazing personality that i would never have known of if i didn't have her you know she just great addition to the family despite having sickle cell so it's like yes you've got it but she's an amazing you know little human being so just affirming her when she is healthy and well and just kind of encouraging that personality out of her and just affirming like validating her feelings yes but say that you know we can what can we do with it now if you feel this way let's try all the techniques that we know to try and deal with it. and if we can't do it we need to get go to the hospital f for the pain to go away for it to be managed properly for it to be you know something else to be done so i've kind of since she was young i've kind of kind of learned how to deal with it in that way if not it becomes so overwhelming for me if I don't know, like, okay, okay, I've done everything I need to do at home now. It's not getting better. Let's go hospital. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And then from well, there... I'll definitely, I'll definitely get back to that piece of area as well. Mm -hmm. um, my next question is, um, so what kind of... Um, how can I say this? So we understand there's... Um, we can help them physically, i.e. Like, protecting them when it's cold weather you know, being more smart about when we're traveling, all those kind of things. Um, and you've also said, that you've mentioned about uh, validating some of the feelings and also encouraging and just trying to embellish in terms of focus on your child's personality and bringing that forth. Um, what other support, but not from you, from others, from your friends and family? I mean, <clears throat> ideally, you know, obviously just a normal, um, I guess, you know, uncle, cousins, they were just, you know, like normal, like without the idea of the sickle cell disease, like it's not a big issue. But I mean, when, when she's in hospital, he's in hospital and you're spending weeks in there, um, you, you're having to rearrange your work, you're having to rearrange, you know, food for yourself, you're having to arrange the car or parking or who's going to have the car or how's your other sibling going to, what kind of um, support would you or ideal would like to have in mind or give to others in terms of family and friends that could help you as a parent directly with your child? For me personally, I call my dad and my brothers. They will pick up my son or have him over. My mm -hmm. partner will bring me food and extra clothing or he'll stay at the hospital while I come, maybe have a wash, get dressed and, you know, go back in there. My friends will call me and ask me, do I need any food? How am I doing? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm grateful for the support that I do have. If I do need to call anybody, they'll be there to kind of help my son, like let him stay over at his, my dad's house and then he would drop him to school for me. Because we've had that once 
where he would literally sleep over at my dad's house and from late into happening he would drop him in the morning because I was still having to be at the hospital and my partner had to work so it, I do have the support like that and people just calling and checking in and you know really so how is she doing what do you need can we come and visit you as well which is really good mm -hmm. just to kind of have that distraction and some sort of social communication the reason why i asked this is because i found and some other parents i've spoken to we find that um again you know you're pregnant woo, we're having a baby and you know in the family and the friends are all excited and all of that jazz and then what you sometimes what i've noticed with myself and some other parents is that you know your tight friends they're not understanding sickle cell disease not necessarily it's conditioned but the communicating part of it because I feel like some people generally feel like they don't know how to I guess empathize or help even though they know that they can't help or change anything if that makes sense so I just wanted to open up a dialogue in, in things that people can do even though they can't change the situation intentionally but what things still help us in the whole process what do you think oh Alanda? um I think, um, what can people do? I think have an understanding, educate themselves on what sickle cell is. Mm -hmm. um, because as Tara said, you know, it, when you hear people are still asking, what is this thing? And one, one guy, one man said to me, um, what did he say again? Uh, it's a bit like the theory of evolution. People with sickle cell are the broken ones and they shouldn't be here. Survival of the fittest. And I'm like, what? Wait. The thing is, he was lucky he caught me that day because <laughs> honestly, I was on a, a solace stall, the support group stall, spreading awareness about sickle cell. So obviously I'm there as a professional. So I couldn't really respond in the way that I would have if mm. that wasn't the case. Because honestly, I just wanted to cuss the man. I wanted mm. to cuss his whatever. Mm. But I had to remain calm and then just sort of start explaining that what he just said was nonsense. Basically. Because then if, if, he, if he was to maintain that thought process, every single person on this planet more than likely shouldn't be here because all of us have got something going on of course. you know everybody's got something going on so all that nonsense he spoke was just rubbish um so yeah I, I would like for people to um have an understanding of what sickle cell is um i'm lucky in my family that i have one sister who's a nurse another sister who works in pharmacy so um they kind of understand already plus also because our mother had sickle cell but having said that she, my mum only found out she had sickle cell when she was 50 um, because they kept telling her yeah they kept telling her that she, it was arthritis all the pain she was feeling was arthritis oh my goodness so my mum was there struggling and struggling and then I remember some um, my mum was in a really bad pain one day really really seriously bad and some church people came around and decided that they would do some kind of I don't even know what to call it all right no worries uh, so they start <laughs> pulling on her arms where the pain oh. was in her arm they're pulling on it trying to get out whatever thing was inside of her that shouldn't be there oh goodness and just talking on her oh. and all that and i i was how old was i i think i was about 18 something like um, that and I was scared because I was like, because you know, you're taught to respect your elders. So I couldn't contradict what they were doing. But at the same time, my mum. So you didn't even know. So no. you just, you're just thinking, oh, yeah, I could. Oh. I, did, I didn't know what to make of it. And in the end, yeah, she, she ended up in hospital <laughs> very soon after that. Um, but yeah, so I think, yeah, I would like of you to to get to know what it is um, and to to do the research and to, and to understand that actually sickle cell is not a rare disease. It's something that occurs one in how many babies 
you know, in England. So people need to, to know. And also that it's, although yes, it's the majority of our people, there are also people who don't look anything like us who have sickle cell, you know? And, and so it's, it's important for people to understand. And also not to just go for any, any old gimmick to, to tell you that it's going to cure you. I mean, I've heard so many people talk about, oh, you know, you should take this, you should take that. It's going to cure you of all your pain. And the same people that told me that, they're still in pain today, so. Okay, so I think we've, we've talked about, like, their pains, and we also know that every person who has sickle cell, um, no two people are the same. And so, yes, we understand the common dangers, i.e. the acute chest pains, um, stroke, and you know, organ failures, body like organs or failing the organs. Um, and my question then is, um, oh gosh, I got sidetracked for question, give me one second. So, yes. So, with that, how do you, as a parent, gauge your child's threshold. Like, what gets you, what what are the things which you identify with? Actually, my child needs to go. Not just because of the information, but just because you know your child's threshold. Um, and I guess, um, how do you? Yeah, that whole process is. Can anybody express that for themselves? I, I think for me, in terms of his threshold, um, it's changed over the years. Okay. Um, and so obviously when they're much younger, you just make your decision straight with them. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but as they get older and more independent, as Amira and Amiri are, <laughs> Uh -huh. um, you kind of have to give them a bit of a, a bit of space so that they can make that decision uh -huh. and um, well not make the decision but well depends no, on no, how no, they no, are no, but yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and so I know like the amount of times I've had to go to the school to pick him up when he's in pain and um I remember the last really big pain at school when I picked him up and I said, okay, I'm going to quickly run home because I didn't know how much pain he was in. Cause you know, sometimes the schools, they get scared and they call you for every little mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. But when I got there and I saw him, he was in the medical room, lying down, couldn't even move. Mm. And so I thought, okay, yeah, hospital. So um, I said, all right, Amira, you know what? I'm going to have to go home. First he said, mummy, you can't just take me there now, take me to the hospital now. Mm. And I thought, okay, that boy has gone over his threshold. We need mm. to get him to the hospital right now. And he's not someone that wants to go to hospital. I'm not uh, saying anyone does really, but it's like, you can kind of see in his eyes when he's reached that threshold, the mm -hmm. eyes tell it all, you know? And as, as, um, as your daughter, Betty, gets older, mm -hmm she'll start to recognize everything for herself and then you'll mm -hmm. look at her and you won't even have to ask questions mm -hmm. about it mm -hmm. it's um yeah and and things change at the hospital as well as they get older when the children are very young or you know your daughter's age i think they are much more um they, they give them a, a lot more um support i think yeah. in yeah. pediatrics yeah adult care even though as far as i'm concerned <laughs> 16 is not an adult not and, really. and yet 16 is when they deem my child old enough to go to adult care uh -huh. it freaks me out when i think about it because i'm scared that with him he doesn't really like to admit he downplays his pain verbally he will downplay it so so he said he just said to me i do not but he does. <laughs> even, the even the doctors told me uh -huh. when they look at when they look at his his um, sats or whatever they're called. I remember them saying to me, well, "He says he's not in that much pain, but look at this." Uh -huh. And I just, you know, I just do that, and I just think, you know what? 
when he's when he's ready, he will talk about it. But right now, he's not interested in talking about it. Mm. He's not. All right, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, Amira, um, I think you've met Amira, Miss O. Um, she course. wasn't vocal, mm. um, yeah, at some point. But then at some point, I think it was just about when she got over 60, she was like, you're always talking for me. We go to the appointments and you're always talking and you don't let me speak. And so I kind of like stepped back. So now she will, uh, you know, the obvious are there where you can see, but she would actually, she goes to that hospital and she don't take nothing from them now. She's like, no, I need A, B, C, D, especially in A and E, you know, when you're, they're like faffing, it, not, I shouldn't say this, not faffing around, mm -hmm. when they're busy and they're dealing with more urgent cases. Emma is like, no, sorry, I'm not waiting. Just give me something now and then I'm happy to wait. She doesn't. Yeah. I'm just in the corner like, wow, what yeah. happened to you? It's like, mother, listen, I need to like tell them. Otherwise, they forget, not forget, but you're just in that room waiting out for... Out of sight, out of mind, oh, isn't it? Yeah. There's yeah. always something urgent that comes along. Yeah. And this, this is urgent. Yeah. So I've got my pacing up and down, oh, how much longer? But now... I let her do her thing. And if she needs me to step in, she just goes quiet and I just step in and do my thing. Yeah. I think yeah. I learned quite early on that um, after a while, um, I guess when he was younger, like three upwards, it was what it was. I could tell. When he became like five, five to 11, because again, he has a social, uh, he has social friends now. And you know when they're at age on who's the strongest, who can run the fastest, <laughs> all that jazz. He would like say they would try and like, oh, it's, I've, you know, downplay the feelings, downplay everything. Um, and I've always tried to reinforce with, with my son, look, just be honest with me. There's no, you know what I'm saying? Just keep it real and honest with me, it's okay. Um, because it's really important. So I guess um, in terms of understanding the threshold, I would agree that. Um, as they age, it will differ in terms of um, just knowing and then communicating. Uh, yeah. But I think what's really important is just building an open um, dialogue with your child and letting and allowing your child to trust that openness and continue to keep that connection um, open. Um, I feel like there was one point with my son where he like that why me scenario came into play and he kind of closed up. So I had to really work being sensitive, being easy, being a listener, mm. um, and just being open, expressing. And also, I had to share with him that, you know, he has sickle cell disease, but there's other people who have different conditions. Like, you've got mm. your legs. Like, do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. people have mm -hmm. legs. They can't actually run. <laughs> so, yeah. you won't be able to run as fast or as often or as longer, but at mm. least you have the opportunity to run this, people who don't have it. So sometimes I will make a context and put it into a context so that it's easier on him um, in terms of that. So this has been really, really awesome. I've got one final question for you guys before we, we put a, you know, a lid on it. Um, what do you need to remember and, and always keep in mind as a parent concerning, um, you know, them having sickle cell disease, i.e. to allow them, not i.e., to elaborate, um, to allow them to have a positive attitude in their own lives, in their own lives. What one thing do you do or say or keep in mind to allow them to have a positive attitude in their own lives? It's a good one, isn't it? <laughs> I think, well, I mean, I think um, I speak to my son about his strengths. Um, because sometimes he talks about how he can't do this or he can't do that or he's not he's not that clever he's not that smart and the exact opposite is true he's, he's a very smart young man his issue is because the amount of times he's been in hospital and has missed so much of school um, it's been really really hard and really really difficult and so he has um, had to have you know some extra tuition from school and so on but yeah. <laughs> he's, he's, in, he's in the background there just uh 
And then I don't know how to take that positively. But anyway, it's worth it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I just tell him mm-hmm. how smart he is and, you know, did you hear that? <laughs> Ignore that. Um, and just, and just you know, give him the chance to do what he's doing. I mean, the, it's, it's really difficult because the things that he really likes doing, the, the sports he loves to do, he can't do now because of the issue with his spine. And um, it's sad because... All he can do now is just play video games. He can't do physical um, things. He can't do PE at school anymore, for example. Mm. Can't do basketball, which is what he loves. Table tennis. Mm. Um, yeah. And so we have to kind of try and focus on other things and it, it kind of explore other things that he might enjoy doing and just right. pick him up. Right. Sarah? Yeah, same. Um, P was a no no, you know. Even if they could, as parents, it was always like, well, no. Take it easy. As much as you want them to do it, it's the aftermath. It's just, Mm -hmm. it's hard. So it was a no. But as they get older, again, I keep going back to that. They find what they love to do. Amir is in uni now. She's about an hour and a half away. Um, She does go to hospital over there and she'll probably just like FaceTime me and say, you know, I'm in pain and whatnot. Um, so they will find something they love. Um, she's doing, uh, I think it's biomedical science at the moment. Ooh, she doesn't know what she wants to do. So she had, you know, the extra tuition, she had everything and she's just getting on with things. She doesn't let things bring her down. So she doesn't even need me to talk to her, that child. Sometimes I just, you know, when you're just feeling abandoned, like, oh, I want oh, my I need <laughs> Uh, oh, sometimes I'll text her, I'll be like, I haven't heard from you. She'll be like, yeah, I'm busy. I'm like, oh, okay. Sorry, <laughs> Sorry ma. <laughs> but yeah, you know, just, you know, talking, to, encouraging them as much as you can. Tr- you know, tra- not train them, but train them to know their limits. Because mm. when you're talking to them in the house, when they go outside, it's a whole different thing because yes. they see everyone yeah. doing it and they believe or they think they have to. So sometimes, yes, they can try it, but then if they see what happens after, they kind of understand, but it will happen as they get older, as they grow up, mm-hmm. they'll understand, yeah. you know, a little bit more, a little bit more. But when they're younger, you, it's almost like they rely on you 110%, but mm-hmm. as they, you know, develop and, and become their own person, I wouldn't say it gets easier because it's always going to be there, but they become a little bit less, you know, depending on you in a way. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's anything else you want to add to that, Betty? Anything else you want to add to that? Yeah, um, listening to them too, it just shows that they've given their children a good foundation for them to know. So that's why your daughter can be confident and independent in her way. So just continue to maintain that foundation of encouragement of you know affirmation of telling them what they can do and you know trying to let them gauge their limit and just testing things you know test a little bit okay you see this is why is you know it went that way Betty, you are so kind out right now. I don't know if you can see me. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure if we're catching it though. She doesn't realise. She doesn't realise. It's not encouragement. I can hear you. You're frozen as well. When you're... I think I'm back on now. Yeah, yeah. Didn't hear what can you, you said. Me? Can hear you now, but we didn't hear yeah. you before. No, no, no. Okay, sorry. So just a foundation of love and encouragement. Okay. Oh, I don't know where I got off that bit. Okay. So um, today's topic was about pain management in the home, but rather than us talking about the same old, same old ibuprofen and the penicillin watch the professionals do give us, and which is very important for us, we also wanted to kind of 
talk about us as a parent supporting them emotionally and mentally way and how our friends and family can also support us in terms of pain management in terms of not just the moment but what happens after they've been relieved and understanding and coping with the idea that pain is you know a part of having sickle cell disease like and um i want to thank our panel betty and tara and Orlando for joining us this evening i appreciate you and thank you so much for joining us um is there Vanessa, any yes Vanessa, just yes. wanted to say it, it's my name is pronounced oleander Please, I beg you, thank you so much. You know what? Please don't let me do that, you know. But I thought, you know what? I'm going to give it a shot. You know what? Next time I do, I'll just ask you, like, how do you pronounce your name? I'm really, really, I apologize. That's okay. Uh, Sorry? Oleander. Ole Oleander. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um. So, yeah. Um. And I, I, I'm looking forward to hopefully you guys joining again on another topic. And, um. Yeah, I'll see you guys soon.